Okay, I'm sorry that the midterms aren't uh, finished being read yet, but they will be, I promise, if I can promise anything, by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I'll put them in the main office. Next week, we're going to have our discussion on hydrogen sulfide. And I want to talk a little bit about that, what I expect of you. First of all, I want, we're going to divide up into four groups. And I'm going to pass around a sheet. You take your choice. It'll be one from one to two, two to three, three to four, and one in the evening. We have to leave four o'clock because I believe there is a, uh, a speaker in that seminar group next week, isn't there? Yeah, Jack Davies. Jack Davies, OK, good. So please, uh, uh, the people in the front row have first cho choice. Uh, that's the way it goes. Um, <clears throat> No more than, hopefully, no more nine to a group, more than nine to a group, uh, unless there's some reason why you can't make it one of the other times. We, unfortunately, we can't get 1098. We'll meet in the middle of fermentation room, but I think if the weather's good, we might as well go outside. What I want you to do on this, I want you to read the article uh, to know what's in that article, not necessarily to bring in outside references to refute it or not or to substantiate it. In other words, I want you to think for, yourself in, for yourselves in terms of this article, knowing what Rankin said um, and what he meant. And then we can talk about whether you agree or not toward the end. So you can always, it's always easy to bring in another reference. And then to really read that one, you have to bring in another reference. And you never really read the one you're reading thoroughly. So we're going to do this uh, this way. We'll discuss it, assuming that it's gospel. And then the last. Uh, 15 or 20 minutes, we can, the, the lid can be off and we can uh, evaluate it. We can talk about whether we agree with him or not. <laughs> well, another thing, next Thursday, your first results are due from lab experiment number five, which is the one on counting, cell counting. There's not much to report, but I want you to report what you got. The right answer is what you got. In other words, we'll, what we're trying to find out is what 39 uh, uh, almost experts would get uh, uh, trying to evaluate this uh, culture, and we can then we can look at the results and see how much variation there are, and we can we can get some idea of how good this technique is with with people that haven't had much training at it. Yeah. Yes. If you, I, I want you to report what you got, unless you didn't get anything. <laughs> and then there are some more tubes down there, and I think there's enough for everybody that's had some difficulty to do it over. If there's not, let me know. The only thing I can think about the people that, people that didn't get anything, you know, yeast settle. And it's possible that you didn't mix the cultures well enough or waited too long between times. You should mix this. Perhaps that's not clear in the, in the, in the discussion of the experiment, that you should really um, shake the tube just before you're. It's considered as Well, well just, just, yeah. Actually, a vortex mixture is best. Mixer is best, but just shaking a few times and then pipetting right away. Don't set it down and come back uh, half hour later. Well, I don't know what I don't. We don't always know what went wrong. Well, there's no lab today, and I think that you ought not to go in unless for some special reason. We've really been uh, hitting the lab hard. We might uh, give the lab a break and give yourself one. Uh, the laboratory is some, sometimes uh, laboratory is too, sometimes too much with us. Late and soon to paraphrase William Blake. Um, if you are a little bit behind, go in. That's OK. And there are a couple of things that you could do if you're in there. <laughs> One is, <laughs> if you want to transfer your spore cultures, that wouldn't be bad. Uh, if your if you're, um, bacteria, if you think they're going to get the contamination is going to catch up with them and you want to transfer them to the slants and the stabs, you can do that today, too. I'll talk about that. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. One other thing that you could do, and I'm a little bit concerned about, is the number three experiment of the uh, fermentation of the wines. Uh, the group, the Montrachet group from uh, last Tuesday evening found that it looked like their wines were being or stuck or going very slowly. And this really sh shook me. Uh, it's one group has already, it's already gone to dryness, right? <laughs> what? Somebody, yeah. And it was dry, right? Yeah, so I don't know what's happening in this one case. What we did, what I suggested in that case was to take the fermentation bung off and shake it to let air in <laughs> or to resuspend the cells or to let the CO2 out. I don't know. But hope, I think it would be good if you could read those. And if we, ho we hope that that is going to go to dryness, because that kind of shoots that experiment if we don't get it to dryness. OK, I'm going to, I'm going to start on bacterial identification. Is there any questions first before we begin? 
Rick, did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Yeah, I did. So. Is, is uh, there any more recorded off costs? Uh, yeah, I gave somebody four. Did you use them all, Mr. Oliver? Did you use them all? No, I just, I just used the one player. Before. Yeah, okay. And where is it? Do you know the others? Yeah, it's, it's in the chair oh. on the tray. Well, I got two upstairs. but I, Who needs them? We just need four. What? plates. Well, I made enough for everybody, but uh, we'll look. I don't know where you put those. It's, I think they're gone. Yeah, they're, they're, they're on the <coughs> On the bottom part of the oh, okay. Well, I'll check on that afterwards. Though th those are easy to make up, so that's not too bad. There's there's plenty of the others. Okay. Let's say that you have your bacteria purified. Uh, you've been taking it from one plate to another until you it's been well isolated. Now we want to do something with it, and the directions say in our second or our fourth experiment, I guess it is, that we should find out if it's catalase positive or negative. That's the first thing we want to do. Now, the catalase te te test is rather easy. You use 3% hydrogen peroxide. The commercial hydrogen peroxide that you buy is 30%. So it's just a question of diluting it 1 to 10. And you do this just before you use it, because it deteriorates rapidly. We have the hydrogen peroxide down there, and I'll leave it there if you want to use it today. But ordinarily, we should store it in the refrigerator, because it does deteriorate. So now we have, so we use 3%. Now, how do we do the test? You can put it right on the colony, but it kills the colony. Perhaps a better way is to uh, put a drop of this on a microscope slide, and then with a loop, put some of the colony on it and look for foaming <coughs> or bubbling. Now, what could you use as a control to make sure that you have adequate hydrogen peroxide? What would be an easy control that you have readily available? What do you know that it's aerobic? <laughs> Some yeast would be good. Just use some, ye some yeast. And it would be very good to see a yeast or catalyst positive. It would be very good to make sure that you're, you know what you're supposed to be looking for. Bubbles forming. That is ox oxygen being formed from this. One thing I should uh, point out is that the loop, when it, the hot loop, will tend to bring a little bubbling, too, on the hydrogen peroxide. So make sure you're not getting bubbling from that, that sort of an, ar that sort of an, ar of an artifact. So now we have got the, uh, the yeast, uh, pardon me, the bacteria divided into whether they're aerobes or ana anaerobes, we can decide what to put them on. And the aerobes, we'll put them on a slant. And we have some uh, modified rugosa with actodione slants. So you can put that, put, pick out one aerobe if you have one, hopefully you have one, for identification. And an anaerobe. We won't put that on a slant. We want to do a confirmatory test to say whether it's oxidative or not. And we'll put, make, a, make a stab culture of it and a broth culture. The reason for each of these. The stab culture is one of these little vials with auger in it up to there. And you take a needle and put it on, put it on your, uh, your, your colony and stick it down in there. Now, where this grows tells us something about the organism. An aerobe will grow just around, will form a surface colony on the top, an obligate aerobe. But an, an obligate anaerobe will go down here someplace, because the oxygen will prevent it from, from um, growing in here. But what do we usually classify lactic acid bacteria as? Micro yeah, microaerophilic. So supposedly, what, you know what that means? Microaerophilic. It means they loved what? Right. In other words, they love a uh, little, little oxygen rather than too much or not enough. So that means they should grow right in here. And not so much down here and not so much up here. In fact, that will discover that microaerophilic micro really doesn't apply to most lactic acid bacteria. They really don't, the air doesn't have much effect on them. But this is a good uh, test and it's a good way to store the organism too. But it's kind of inconvenient when we want to do identification of it, so it's also good to have a broth culture. So inoculate some broth so you can use that for some of the tests that we'll be doing starting uh, Tuesday or the following Tuesday. Can you work on those little projects if you want to see? Yeah, you can do that. All right, now let's, uh, we can use the handout as a guide here. I want to talk about, very quickly, about how we're going to identify these organisms, and we'll just identify them to 
um, genera and not worry about species. Now, the aerobes, the chances of being aerobes, you can see what they are. Uh, they might be bacillus, are more likely to be acetic acid bacteria. Now, bacillus, I don't think, is very important. It does happen that there was a paper published by, by Vaughn and some other workers here at Davis that they found some bacilli in some dessert wines from the, uh, from the university. There was a kind of an artificially situ uh, set up experimental wines, that these weren't commercial wines. But it does indicate that bacilli could be in wines, and so I think we have to keep that into account if we're looking at spoiled wines. Now, um, I've listed here in brackets what Berge's manual says about these different organisms or how they classify them. There's a new Berge's that's due out momentarily. It was supposed to be ready for the um, American Society of Microbiology meetings, which are just about now. But they, I'm going to read this, but it's nothing you have to remember, but it's something that if you wanted to know where these fit into the general Berge's, it would be helpful. Because, again, like uh, with the yeast, we're this is an abbreviated taxonomy that you can use, but for verification, you may want to go to Berge's itself to make sure that you do have the organism that you, this says you do, because we've left out a lot of things that, because they've never been found in wine. Well, Berge's has part 15 as endospore-forming rods and cocci, and includes bacillus, which are rods, under aerobic, under aerobic rods, along with two other genera, and then the clostridium and the other, the uh, cocci, are there, excuse me, excuse me, the uh, anaerobes are given under anaerobic. Well, the characteristics of bacilli then would be that it'd be an obligate aerobe, it would be catalase positive, and on a stab culture, which you won't do because uh, you, it's catalase positive, you only do the stab with catalase negative, you would get surface colony. It's gram positive, negative, or variable. So, so much for your gram stain, Mr. Steele. So we don't worry about that. Um, we wouldn't get a clearing on calcium carbonate plate. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's what we, that's the positive identification for acetic acid bacteria. And spores, if they're present, would be heat resistant. Now this kind of spore is different from the spores with yeast. It has nothing to do with the sexuality of the, of the bacterium, but it's a, it's a defense mechanism that will withstand higher heat. And one good way to test if you have spores is to heat it for a minute in boiling water. And the spores will resist this and then you can uh, plate them out, on a, streak them out on a plate and they'll grow. The problem is you don't, are not always sure that you're going to have spores. It may be a vegetative culture. And about the best thing that I can uh, determine in order to induce spores from some uh, bacillus experts here on campus is that the older the culture is, the more likely you are to have spores. And sometimes you can induce spore formation by ad addition of uh, mangan manganus uh, sulfate. Hmm? Nobody knows, I don't think. I don't know, the mechanism is it's just barely understood. There's a lot of, a lot of research on, on what happens during sporulation in bacilli and in other organisms too. Well, let's go on to the, probably the more important one is the acetic acid bacteria. Now, Berge's lists it in, in part seven as gram-negative rods, strictly aerobic rods, and includes four families. However, listed separately are the acetobacter and six other genera under genera of uncertain affiliation. <laughs> Berge's isn't quite as helpful as it, we might like it to be sometimes. Now here, we get clearing of a calcium carbonate plate. This is a plate which has as an energy source ethanol, and it also has precipitated calcium carbonate in it, which is suspended. It's tricky to make because you want the, uh, before, before the auger solidifies, you want the calcium carbonate to be throughout the auger, not just sunk down to the bottom. And then when the, as you know, when the acetobacter uh, uh, oxidizes the ethanol to acetic acid, then it uh, neutralizes the calcium carbonate and you get a nice clearing. What happens if you had glucose in there also? You know? Well, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get the, 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 the organisms would prefer to use glucose until the glucose is all gone. And you may never get clearing. So it's important that you have added that, add, that, that ethanol be added. And it's also important that these be fresh plates because the ethanol is added after autoclaving and as the plates sit around, the ethanol can volatilize off. So they should be fresh calcium carbonate plates. Um, and of course, there's no spores. 
and it's gram negative or variable, so gram, gram stain doesn't help us. Now, I've divided them into the acetomonas, the acetomonas and acetobacter. Now, in the seventh edition of Burgi's, uh, acetomonas wasn't given. Um, and I don't think it's given in the eighth edition either. I haven't seen this part of the uh, eighth edition of Burgi's. But for convenience, I've, I've uh, listed them separately. The acetomonas are ones that clear the calcium carbonate ethanol plates, as I said. They only carry the oxidation as far as acetic acid. However, the acetobacter, the vinegar bacteria, not only oxidize the, acid, the ethanol to acetic acid, but they can carry out uh, further oxidation of the acetic acid to carbon dioxide and water. And then what happens? The calcium carbonate will re-precipitate again. So you might miss it. <laughs> you might miss the clearing. Not really. The precipitation looks different. It's much more regular than it was uh, before the clearing. Does this strike you as strange that the acetobacteria, the vinegar bacteria, are the ones that, that oxidize beyond ethanol, uh, beyond uh, um, acetic acid, rather than the acetomonas? You'd think it might be the other way around. The vinegar bacteria would be the ones that only take it that far. What do we know about vinegar formation that would? Yeah, aerobic. Yeah, but that is this is this is this the important aspect of vinegar formation for, for uh, vinegar production? Yeah, you can go too far. You can spoil your vinegar by not harvesting it soon enough. Spoil vinegar. Spoil vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> I made a note here that as we mentioned before that some acetic acid bacteria require low pH plates for or for a low pH to grow, or to re remain viable. And often, constant oxidation is required. You can shut off a, a vinegar uh, production, one of these um, aerated columns, and lose most of your viability if you shut off the air long enough. Any questions about the aerobes, though? This is mostly a review for you, I know. Yeah. One question. Uh, in stack cultures, I know if you do uh, the coli that way, they'll grow throughout the stack culture. Well, I think it depends on the, how much gas they produce down there and, and break it open. And then it gives them more surface to work on. Yeah. Is that common back here? No, no. No, only things we're, we'll have here, yeah. Uh, if you use calcium carbonate, doesn't it raise the pH pretty much on the plate? That's a good point. Uh, I just think it would, but. Uh, it works okay. <laughs> I never checked the pH afterwards. Well, that's one thing. It's uh, it's insoluble. It's insoluble. Yeah. So you're not doing too much. No. No, I wouldn't. That doesn't. Then if you added bicarbonate, you probably would. Yeah. Any more? Okay. Now let's go on to the lactic acid bacteria, which are a lot more fun. Now, how do we know? We know that they're anaerobes. <laughs> they have to be lactic acid bacteria if they're from wine. But how can we check that? An easy way would be to see what the end product is, to see if it's lactic acid or not. And a good way is to use the paper chromatography method. Now, you have to caution, be cautious here that you're measuring lactic acid from sugar. That's the definition of lactic acid bacteria, that it's, the sugar is a substrate and it takes it to lactic acid. OK, if you have that, you're OK. One thing I should, one point that, a small point that the the paper chromatogram might lead you astray. Do you remember reading yet about what goes to the lactic acid spot? What else goes to lactic acid? Succinate, yeah. So you might, you might be getting succinate, not very likely. Actually, the two spots don't quite overlap. And if you, I mean, they overlap, but they don't quite coincide. And so if you use the proper controls, you'd be all right, I think, to show this lactic acid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, it's. No, I mean, what, what if it's not lactic acid bacteria? What if it's some other organism that was making succinate? Not very likely, but that's something just good trick question. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we know that the lactic acid bacteria, and we know it's gram positive in young cultures only. So there again, the gram stain doesn't do us any good. In old cultures, we don't have, uh, it's gram variable. Another thing that's interesting is that it's fastidious nutrition, that you're not going to get it to grow in a very simple medium. You're going to have to add uh, the minimum yeast extract and maybe lots of other things, peptone, tryptone, tween 80 perhaps, uh, so they get a lot of vitamins and amino acids. What is 
Between 80 is a, is a <laughs> what is it, last night? It's an ester of uh, oleic acid, but what's the, what's the, uh, what's it esterified to? No, no. It's, just, it's a, yeah, it's a sorbitol, I think, residue. Um, now, I've got microaerophilic, and I put that as a question mark there because it may not be actually microaerophilic. And we're going to, in a minute, talk about the aerobic metabolism of some of these organisms. There's a qu quite a variety of, of possibilities from all the way from, from no utilization of oxygen at all to a slight utilization. Well, we're going to divide them into two, class, two classes, the cocci and the rods. And it seems like that'd be pretty simple. There's a coccus and there's a rod. But it's not that simple because what we call coccus, such as uh, leuconostoc, uh, in the kind of medium we're using with vegetable juice or fruit juices, often is elongated and not really round. And so we have to make some arbitrary definition. And we've chosen whether that the length to the width ratio is less than two. In other words, that this would be not greater than twice this. We'll call it a, a sphere or a caucus then. Again, Berge's. Um, this, is, this is a big, a big uh, change in Berge's manual this year. All before, all the lactic acid bacteria were in one family, the Lactobacilli ACE. But now they've divided this up into two different uh, groups, the, um, the rods and the, the cocci. Berge's is part 14 gram-positive cocci is divided into two classifications, either aerobic and or facultative anaerobic or anaerobic organisms. And the former then is divided into two families, of which one you're familiar with, the uh, Mycococciaceae and the Streptococciaceae. The Leuconostox and Pediococci are listed under the second family in the, in the tribe of Streptococci. And then other genera of this tribe are Streptococcus, Aerococcus, and Grimella. OK, now we'll get down to the ones that we're interested in. First thing we've got to do is decide if they're heterofermentative or homofermentative. Now, I think it'd be good to, di to uh, divert our attention a little bit from the, from the outline to talk about the difference between heterofermentative and homofermentative bacteria, because this is going to be important when we talk about malolactic uh, fermentation. Basically, can you tell me what the difference is? First of all, on a test, it's easy. You look for gas uh, formation. Isn't the homofermentative change sugar exclusively to lactic acid? That's the idea. The idea that there only, there's only one product, that's why it's called homofermentative, and that would be that we get, we'll say, glucose going only to lactic acid. And that would be two lactic acid molecules per glucose. Now, what would heterofermentative be? Well, we'll say lactic acid for sure, and CO2. The other fragment is a two-carbon fragment. It may not be ethanol. It could be acetic acid. Now, again, we can't say this is always that. What that we can always draw the line real closely. We figured that. Thank you. <laughs> At least you can read my writing. Thanks. Um, we figure that if 85% goes to uh, lactic acid, we'll call it homofermentative. In other words, if we get a little bit of CO2, we, we won't classify it as heterofermentative. Well, what's going on in the metabolic pathways here? Do you remember what the difference is? Yeah. Right. And the other one is what? Regular glycolysis. And let's just put this scheme on. So we have glucose. We always write it at the top of the board to the left. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, we have it, a few pathways. And then we get to um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And remember what we do here now. We're going to use up a couple of ATPs to give a couple of ADPs. We have two molecules here. Now we go down here quite a ways to pyruvate. 
And again, we use up a couple of ATPs per each molecule. But we're also getting something in return. We're reducing some NAD here. So the cell solves the problem on reoxidizing this by taking it to lactate. We have the reduced NADH going to NAD. And there's no Krebs cycle down here. So if this is working nicely, there's no need then for any, uh, for any oxygen or any hydrogen acceptor from outside. This takes care of everything. Each one of these is reoxidized here. Okay, what, now the other, the other uh, possibility then, th th this is a homophomendic pathway. And as we say, it can be 85% that. There may be some other pathways involved, maybe a little bit of this, but this is the most important pathway. Okay, the glucose then is going to go to, it's going to be oxidized and going to end up as a five carbon, a ribo, let's say pentose, pentose phosphate involving one ATP and giving us off some reduced coenzyme. What kind, do we know? Probably. I'll put this down twice. I'm going to put the P in parentheses because this hasn't been well studied in all these organisms. Most likely that's what's happening though. Getting reduction of NADP. Now this pentose, yes? How about CO2? Yeah, and CO2 goes off. Thank you. Now this pentose phosphate then can be split to give you one of these, which is very nice, and also very nice for the cell. It can take up an inorganic phosphate to go on here to give you acetylphosphate, acetylphosphate, as we say, and not requiring an ATP. It's nice for the cell. Now, we've got to reoxidize these two, don't we? This one goes over here, and we're going to reduce NADH here and reoxidize it here. But we have to reoxidize re these some way. How can we do it? One way might be with oxygen. We'll have to put electro oxygen in the question mark. This may occur in some cases. But how else could we do it? This, would be, this is very nice because this could go to ATP, couldn't it? We gain, and not only didn't we have to use one here, but we gained one here. But I'm afraid we can't use it for that, can we? That's what this is. Yeah, but you can continue around. Well, I think you'd end up the same thing. Well, the thing is, you have to use acetylphosphate as a hydrogen acceptor to reoxidize these two. Now, it won't take the, the NADP, and one has to assume that there's some sort of enzyme system that can transfer this hydrogen to an NAD. So you reoxidize these NADs, and we end up with, um, with ethanol plus phosphate, plus two NADs. And we've balanced everything. If we don't have any oxygen, we can do that. And so this would be the, the, hetero, the uh, hetero fermented pathway. We get one lactate, one two carbon fragment. We could also see where this could be split off here. And we could get, a, uh, we could get acid al uh, acetic acid and the CO2 here. And one more thing we've got to talk about before we leave this. What about the possibility of this pyruvate going over here? Can we do that? Yeah. We can do that. We, we can uh, use coenzyme A to give us, let's say, acetyl coenzyme A. But, we, but in, and, and uh, 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 this can go to acetyl phosphate. But the problem is we also have to use an NAD and get an NADH. So we can't do that unless we do something else. What else can we do to get rid of this NADH? There's no Krebs cycle. Let's get this right. That's the whole point. There's no Krebs cycle. What we could do is reoxidize this with another pyruvate to go to lactate. So we could have two pyruvates going to one acetyl-CoA, one, um, one lactate, and our NADs would balance out. Or the other possibility is the role of oxygen, which we'll have to put a question mark. It might be possible to reoxidize this NADH here with oxygen. 
Well, in terms of what we know about different organisms, all these things are possible. There is some studies with some um, uh, lactobacillus on using galactose as the energy source. Where, and uh, there is an uptake of oxygen. Actually, the, there's been a measurement of the respiration and the um, molar growth yield on galactose. And it's quite substantial, meaning that this pathway of reoxidizing this, this coenzyme with oxygen is possible in some organisms. We also know that there are some organisms that don't do this at all. They don't use oxygen at all. They don't have catalase. They don't have any way to get rid of any of the toxic effects of oxygen. Uh, this often happens to organisms that are obli um, obligate anaerobes, that they will reduce oxygen to that or to hydrogen peroxide, and they don't have any way to get rid of this. They don't have any catalase or, uh, um, what's the other word? The, uh, dismutase is super dismutase to get rid of these and it kills the organism. Well these lactic acid bacteria don't have any mechanism to get rid of these and they don't die in the presence of high concentrations of oxygen so the feeling is that they don't use oxygen at all. So we do have the possibility of, of organisms that are completely anaerobic or ones that can use a little bit of oxygen or use oxygen a little bit. Now we also said these are catalase negative it's possible to develop catalase positive a little bit in some of these organisms by putting them on very strict, uh, um, growing them on very low energy sources that eventually you can measure very weak catalase positive reaction. So it's again, it's an all, all a relative thing and we'd have to talk about each organism before we could be sure what we're talking about. This catalase business I just mentioned now doesn't affect the classification because we're doing our test on organisms that have been grown in a rich medium, and so they would not have catalase test. Oh, okay, all that for hetero and homo humanity. Any questions on that? Because we'll have to come back to this. We're using uh, Rugosa. Well, the growth. The growth you, on M MRA plates, you just take that off that plate and, and put it onto some um, um, hydrogen peroxide. To, to get any of these organisms to show catalase positive, I'll repeat that, you have to grow them under very restrictive conditions. I, I your uh, oh, the way you do this test. Okay. What do we do? We want to measure gas production. That's the way we do this test. And we could use durum tubes like we do for the fermentation of the yeast. But there's not very much gas formed uh, compared to the yeast. They don't grow as fast and they don't uh, produce as much gas. So we want something a little more um, encompassing that we can collect more of the gas. And what we do then is take a tube with broth, inoculate it, and pour a liquid material over there which will solidify. And something called vas, uh, Vaspar, which is a mixture of Vaseline and para paraffin, melted together, autoclave to uh, sterilize it. And then it's molten, but not too hot, so you won't heat this up too much. Don't want to kill the bacteria. Pour that on the top here, and it'll make a solid plug, which clings to the walls. Now when gas is formed, it'll push that plug up. So that's the way we do the hetero, heterolactic fermentation, he homo or hetero fermentation. Now, can we do this in, uh, say, Rugosa medium with uh, malic acid in it, which, 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 which is what we've been using, which is what we've been using for growing our organisms for this test? Think about that. From malic acid, to, if, we get, if we had a malolactic organism, it's going to give CO2 from malic acid. So it's going to, it's going to uh, um, mask this CO2 coming off here. We wouldn't be able to say whether the CO2 was from the malic acid or from the glucose itself. So it's important for this test that you do medium without malic acid. If we ever had an organism that, that had absolutely required malic acid for growth, I don't know how we would do the uh, hetero or homo fermentative test. Um, yes, I do. There is another way. We're yeah, going to do it. Isn't there a test for uh, heterofermentative that changes uh, sugar into... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. The, the heterofermentatives also will metabolize fructose to mannitol. And so we'll do this test too. Has anybody done this? Do you know how an easy way to establish a chap mannitol? formed. It's called the rosette test. You let this, you inoculate your tube and let it grow. 
I mean, you get good growth. The, the tube has high concentration of fructose, say 2%. Then you pour this, the whole five milliliters, into a watch glass and let it dry. And as it dries, large macro crystals, not something you have to look under the microscope, but something you can see with, without the microscope, of crystals like this form from the high concentration of mannitol that's there, that if, if it's heterolactic. And that's the way you do this test. So, I think we can solve the problems pretty easily. If we had co cocci and they were heterofermentative and they're from wine, we could say, ergo, that they're leuconostoc. That's really easy, isn't it? Now, we could confirm this with a negative arginine test. And I'll talk about that again in a, minute, in a minute when we come back to, lactic acid, to lactobacillus. Also, we could confirm it by seeing what kind of lactic acid is formed. Now, from sugar. Gluco, I mean, glucose can go to three different kinds of lactic acid. It's time to talk about that. It can go to L, lactic acid, D, or DL. Now, it might go to one of the, it might go to these directly, or there might be a racemase that changes one of these into the other. But they have, these are characteristic end products from glucose. Again, we don't want malic acid there. Because malic goes only to, la to L-lactic. We don't want to confuse the issue by having that L-lactic su superimposed on this. Now, this used to be a very difficult procedure to be able to determine these. You had to do a crystallization and solubility differentiation. But it's easy now because we can buy the different dehydrogenases, L-lactic dehydrogenase and D-lactic dehydrogenase. So we just take the end product. We won't be doing it necessarily in class, but we take the end product and do um, analysis for how much L-lactic is there and how much D-lactic is there, just the way you've done for malic acid enzyme analysis in one of your other courses. One thing that's a little tricky here, what do you suppose, we know, what, is the, what does big D stand for besides Dallas? What does small d stand for? Stall, small d stands for dextrorotatory. What does big D stand for? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a certain type of structure that relates to uh, uh, glyceraldehyde. And usually, big D and little d are the same, and usually what's big D is dextrorotatory, but not always. And here's a case where it's not, in a water solution. That, so this will be written D minus and L plus. It's kind of confusing. Do you know of any other uh, uh, acid that, that enologists have to worry, worry about that has the same... Uh, hmm? Tartaric, not malic. Malic is okay, but tartaric. And you find all sorts of people making mistakes, like me and Dr. Amory in uh, the article in the yeast. We listed, uh, we listed as big D tartaric and it's big L tartaric acid. They don't know you, though. You might be right in the <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting story, too, if they don't really know. Oh, they really know. Yeah. Um, but you know more about whether they know or not because it was important to you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and then if, they're, if it's not homofermentative, ooh, the time. If it's not homofermentative, if it is homofermentative, then the, it's pediococcus. And you, again, you wouldn't get the rosettes with this test, and you'd get no gas formation. The pediococcus is easy to see by looking at, it's easy to uh, recognize under the microscope because you really have a sphere. It's not like the leuconostox, which will be slightly elongated. It's really a sphere, and there may be two spheres, or there may be in tetrads, like this. Oops. I mean, all each looking exactly like its neighbor. Um, I've listed, and it produces DL lactic acid. And this is kind of a good thing to know. If you wanted to differentiate it from streptococci, which have not been isolated from wine, even though there's been, you see that, uh, those, that terminology used sometimes, but it's been incorrect classification. But the streptococci always produce L-lactic acid. OK, let's go on to the rods. And this would be a case where the, the length would be twice the width. And if these are. Um, from wine, or let's say if they produce lactic acid and they're rods, 
classification is over. They're lactobacilli. It doesn't matter if they're homofermentative or heterofermentative. However, if that's what you get, I want you to do the homo and uh, hetero test because it would be needed for the species classification, which we don't need to do, but I want you to know how to do the test. Let's see what Berge says about uh, this. There should be uh, brackets around this. I don't want you to have to learn that. Berge's. This is, uh, again, the 8th edition. Part 16, non-sporine, sporine, rod-shaped bacteria uh, gives lact lactobacillus and three other genera under the family Lactobacilliaceae. See, I said before the Lactobacilliaceae included the, the cocci, the Pediococcus and the Leuconostoc. So Lactobacillus species are hetero or homofermentative. Now, we have some problems sometimes on telling whether we do have a, a spore, a, or a coccus or a rod. And there is a way we can help, uh, that we can uh, avoid this difficulty. One thing, if it is almost like the, almost a, a coccus, but not quite, we can rule out pediococcus. The only thing we have to worry about, is it leuconostoc or is it uh, lactobacillus? Is it a long leuconostoc or is it a short lactobacillus? And the way we can tell that, that is by the, the um, uh, ni uh, nitrogen, um, ammonia formation from arginine. Now, the, uh, the leuconostocs give a negative test for ammonia from arginine. Now, which, which uh, lactic acid bacteria do we have to worry about? Um, we have to worry about the short ones. We only have to worry about those that produce D-lactic acid. Because we're, we're only getting confused between the leuconostocs and the short lactic acid bacteria. So we'll only worry about those, that would, those lactic acid bacteria which are short and which produce D-lactic acid. And those all produce our ammonia positive with one exception, wouldn't you know? It's almost like French. No, there's always an exception. But there's only one exception, and that's not so bad. And I can't pronounce it. That's uh, Lactobacillus uh, virandesans. And this whole thing that I just talked about now is explained here, uh, hopefully, on the bottom of, of the handout. Um, I made a little scheme here that might help us if we were trying to schematically show these as different. If we had, let's say, that kind of an organism, if it were homofermentative, then we would know right offhand it would be lactobacillus. If it were heterofermentative, then we'd have to determine whether it was D-lactic or L-lactic. And if it were L-lactic, we'd know it would be lactobacillus. If it were D-lactic, and it were ammonia negative from arginine, then it would be leuconostoc or lactobacillus viridesans. And if it, were lacto if it were ammonia positive, then it would be lactobacillus. So it's not too difficult. The other thing about the ones that are really cocci, real spheres, um, if it was D-lactic acid, then it would be leuconostoc. If it were DL, it would be Pediococcus. And if it were L, it would be Streptococcus. And what else do we know about the sources of these? Where generally do these come from? What source? Where, what, what are leuconostocs usually from? Animal, plant, vegetable, mineral? Usually plant source. And Pediococcus? Plant and strep? Hmm? Animal. I know you're going to say, what about the lactic acid bacteria in your. Oh, that's the that's the, uh, lactic acid. That's uh, lactobacillus. So lactobacillus are found in the mouth, but uh, leuconostoc aren't. Well, I, no, we still got some. Yeah, we still got some time. Good. Uh, the next handout uh, tells about species of wine-related lactic acid bacteria. And we don't, you don't have to know this, but I think it would be good to, for us to quickly go over it so you know what you would be getting into if you wanted to uh, carry these down to species. I have to say this, that the, that the new Burgies is not really a dichotomous key. It lumps things. It's a lumper. And you end up with a, 
several organisms in one place, and then you have to go to e the description of each one and see if your organism fits that. And I might say that uh, you might ask me, well, what kinds of lactic acid bacteria do we have? What kinds are isolated from wine? And what kinds are malolactic? Well, I think they all have to be reclassified. There's been new names and new uh, descriptions of these, and I don't know what we'll do when we write a paper, that, if we ever get around to that, on uh, some of these organisms. We have to change their name or not. The, at least for the lactic acid, for the lactobacillus, lactobacilli. Well, we can do, at the top there, I gave an explanation about the uh, D and L lactic acid, and also I gave the address where you can buy the D lactic dehydrogenase enzyme, because there's only one place that I know that it's a supplier, and you may have difficulty finding it someday if you wanted to uh, buy that. Almost everybody has the L lactic acid, de lactic dehydrogenase. I, I say that uh, Berge's Definitive classifications for different species are based on the isomers of lactic acid that are produced from sugar, the optimal temperature, temperature of growth, which is relatively easy, sugars fermented, which is relatively easy. But get this, GC ratios, the DNA, the guanine cytosine ratios, and the electrophoretic mobility of the lactic dehydrogenases. Of course, you do that in Biochem 101b, I guess, the second part of that. So it's not really so terribly easy to be really definitive about some of these. But we can see that they have divided, the, or Ragosa has divided the, them into th three main groups. First group being homo homofermentative, and then dividing up whether gla or gas is formed from gluconic acid or not, or only from, or none of these would form gas from glucose, but one group B will form glass, gas from gluconate, gluconate. Well, in group A, it depends upon the kind of lactic acid that's formed. And then you'll see the first one there, it, there's five different organisms that it could be. So you have to go to the description. Well, under gas from gluconate, again, it's on the um, basis of the end product, of what kind of lactic acid. Then we go to heterofermentative. And um, we have base, based on um, temperature of growth. Right, that's the basis for those three. And then finally, there's a third group, and I've quoted, quoted the, the source. I think it's pretty, pretty important to quote that. It says, lesser well-known organisms, ethanol tolerance, 15 to 18%. Gluconate and ribose fermentations generally not studied, so we're really in a quandary. And he lists uh, a couple of our friends here, Hilgardia and Trichoides, at least, which have been isolated from wine. And then here's a note. This is, a copy, this is copied from the, the Burgess Manual. Some of the, that's supposed to be the, some of the heterofermentative species found in wine and fruit juices, such as L-Hilgardii and L-Trichoides, are probably only part of a total lactobacillus population of very marked acidophilic organisms, often contributing to the flavor of wines through the malolactic fermentation. I think it's good we got a nice plug in there in the latest burgies. Well, quickly, um, the other, the pediococci and the leuconostoc are much easier. The pediococci, if its temperature of growth is less than 32 degrees, then it's Pediococcus cerevisiae. Now that's from Berge's seventh edition. I don't know if that's going to hold true in the eighth. I haven't seen that chapter. The leuconostoc are really easy, because if they've been isolated from wine, they're going to be leuconostoc enus. Garvey has classified the leuconostocs, which are uh, tolerant to 10% ethanol and pH less than 4.2, or will grow under these conditions, as L enus. She also lists another way to separate them from some of the other leuconostocs on the basis of sugar and maltose and fructose fermentation. You can separate enus from cremorous, uh, oh, enus and cremorous from all other leuconostocs by, by its uh, sucrose or maltose fermentation. And then you can separate enus and cremorous from each other by the fructose and uh, lactose uh, fermentation. Then I should point out that there, this isn't the only classification for the leuconostocs. This is the, one, the official one in, in Burgi's, if that's official. There are, Nanamura in Japan has come up with another scheme for the leuconostocs, which a lot of people like better, but we'll stick with uh, Garvey's. But the Bordeaux school has come up with another classification, which isn't too bad, but we're not going to use it. <laughs> and that's the leuconostocs from wine could be classified into two different groups, uh, Gracil or Enos. And, oh, I didn't put... <laughs> I left out something. The, the gracil is um, arabinose negative, and the enus is arabinose positive. 
Now, often you'll hear people will say ribose, or they'll say pentose, positive or negative. Well, almost all these organisms will use ribose. So you can't use ribose as a classification. You have, you have to use arabinose or xylose. Um, I want you to note the spelling of, of um, enos, the way Peno does it, um, which, is a, which in one hand is good because it separates it from Garvey's classification. Yeah. You said it's ravenous negative, Brazil and Amelot, it says Elinos, ML34 is negative. So which one did you mean? Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, he's, he, lists, uh, he lists one kind as El Enos, O-I-N-O-S. This is an uh, incorrect spelling. And then the other one is El Gracile, Gracile. And this one is... Well, the, the El Enos could be either one of these, according to Garvey's classification. But it happens the organism that we're most interested in, ML34. Let me start again. That, that this is Garvey's. El Enos will include both of these. But ML34, then, according to, to uh, Garvey's classification, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, ravenous positive or negative. According to Pay Nose, it does matter, and it's negative, and so it's classified as this. So what Garvey calls El Enos. ML34, Peno calls El Gracile, get this, CF34. Where do you suppose CF comes from? <laughs> Actually, he got this, he got the culture, I can't blame him, he got the culture from somebody else, but it is our, it is our culture, and so he named it using his, this scheme and named the CF for California. But what does make me kind of mad is he has never changed, <laughs> changed the name or given much credit for it, where it came from in the first place. I guess he it doesn't want the... This is being used in Bordeaux as for making wine. Perhaps he doesn't want the people in Bordeaux to realize they're using a Napa Valley strain of bacteria. But I want to talk about this here. Which is correct here? Does anybody, you've seen this a lot. You've seen this on Daryl Cordy's car. <laughs> Which is correct, you know? Probably the, the I, because that looks more like uh, Greek. Well, it is Greek. That, for Greek, that is right. That is the way it's spelled. But when you transliterate into Latin, this is a diphthong and becomes O-E, like enology. And then some people take off the O. And so this is the correct uh, usage for, and that's why it's in Burgess, because it wasn't, it would be correct. But I'm kind of glad he did that, because otherwise, if he spelled it the same way, it would lead to all sorts of confusion. Now, I might say that Garvey uh, is sensitive, <laughs> is she ever, but she's sensitive to uh, the idea of, be, of, of separating these two uh, this species into two different species on the basis of, of uh, sugar fermentation if, she, if there's ever good evidence that this might be an important thing. But this is the way it is in Garvey, in, uh, in Burgess now. Okay, that time, oh, it's overtime, yeah.